Well, in a year of tough social distancing and keeping apart, two planets dare to be different. It's kind of nice. Tonight, meteorologist Angela Huddy is live at the St. Louis Science Center with the spectacular sky event that's underway. Yeah, Mandy and Vic, it's all about looking up, and we've been doing it all summer at Jupiter and Saturn, and I want you to look up just above the moon here tonight. You can see them in that night sky. These two planets, these giant planets, are going to be the closest they've been in just a few days. It's been hundreds of years. According to NASA, this will be the closest conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn since the Middle Ages. In a year where we could all use a miracle, the start of Christmas week looks to bring one. The bright sight dubbed a quote Christmas star by NASA will light up the night sky two weeks from tonight. And technically it's not a star, but two planets. In this case, Jupiter and Saturn, whose orbits will line up very close to one another relative to the Earth. When two planets align like this, it's referred to as a conjunction. Throughout the year, the two biggest worlds in our solar system have been putting on a show in the southern sky. Each night, we've been watching as Jupiter and Saturn have been getting closer and closer together in our sky. And it's coincidentally on the first day of winter or the winter solstice, we get to see them meet. Really what makes this conjunction great is its rarity. Uh, given the speed that it takes for Jupiter and Saturn to orbit the sun, they only meet in the sky like this every 20 years. The two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, will only be about a tenth of a degree apart in our sky. And what makes that so amazing is no one alive today has see, ever seen Jupiter and Saturn that close before. Some say it's the closest alignment since 1623, others say 1226. It's pretty far apart. Now, that is Jupiter there kind of uh, on the lower part, the bigger looking planet star there in the sky, the planet there. Saturn is the slightly smaller one as it is even farther away. These two coming together in this great conjunction right here around the Christmas holiday has a lot of folks referring to the celestial event as the Christmas star or the Bethlehem star. Of course, they are planets, not stars, but they are putting on an incredible show in our sky right now. Great holiday show and it's one you don't want to miss. Hi, everyone. Are you curious about the 2020 Jupiter and Saturn conjunction and what it means biblically? Well, you have definitely come to the right spot. Hi, my name is Jared. Thanks for joining me today. This is Supernatural by Design, a biblical apologetics channel that covers a wide variety of topics, but especially the end times, which is why we're covering this topic. So if you're interested, then stay tuned, because we are going to discover some unique mysteries that God has been leading me to understand. However, before we begin, I just ask that you take this information before the Lord and ask for yourself, because I'm no one perfect. In fact, God doesn't play favorites. I'm just simply sharing what he's been revealing to me for the purposes of understanding how close we really are to not only the rapture, but the second coming of Christ, which is what this actually is pointing to. And so with that said, let's get into the topic on the December 21st Christmas star, which we first will cover the rarity of the event. Now, I'm an electrical engineer by degree and I love numbers. So whenever something like this happens, it's fun to plug and chug these numbers. However, let me show you how rare this event really is. It's actually quite astonishing. And it's actually comprised of two separate variables. One being the closeness of the planets. And secondly, the fact that it lands on the winter solstice. So let's start with the first part. The last time that these two planets were this close together was back in 1623 and the planets were five degrees separated from each other. The time before that was 1226 when the planets were only two degrees separated. However, for this conjunction on the 21st, it will be less than one degree, a tenth of a degree, which is equivalent to one fifth of a full moon's diameter, making the two planetary objects appearing to form one central light source. And so what's interesting is you also see a 400 year difference between these dates. If you're familiar with four and 40 or 400, even in the Bible, that symbolizes the end of something, like the rain stopping in Noah's time or 
the Jews in the wilderness after their exodus out of Egypt, or even Jesus when he was in the wilderness. And so this is highlighting that same idea or concept with the fact that this is 400 years from its previous spot, meaning that something is getting ready to change significantly, but I don't wanna to get too ahead of myself. So let's talk about the other aspect that makes this rare, which is the fact that it lands on a solstice, the exact day. And for a little background on the winter solstice, the winter solstice is the shortest day and longest night of the year. In fact, many cultures revered this particular day as being a sign of rebirth. However, it's the fact that this conjunction lands on that date that makes it significant. Because if you remember uh, a previous video that I did on the annular eclipse, it landed on the summer solstice. So the fact that we have two celestial events landing on solstices, <laughs> you can't coach that. That is rare. That's, that's a God thing, guys. But I don't want to muddy the waters with all the numbers. But anyways, for the summer solstice to have an annual eclipse is four chances out of 366 days because we're in a leap year. Then that means that for this to land on the winter solstice would be three chances out of 366. You multiply those two together times the fact that if you have three of these over a course of a thousand years, it's one chance in 2.6 million for this to occur with the closeness of the planets and to land on the winter solstice within the same year. And this is a conservative approach because this is not also taking into the account the blue moon that landed on Halloween as well as for penumbral moons in a row or a penumbral tetrad. In fact, celestially, 2020 has been filled with many unique anomalies. And considering the year of 2020, celestial signs aren't arbitrary. God uses them for a very specific reason. And it's also how we know the 2020 conjunction is significant. Another unique feature about this conjunction is the fact that it will be able to be seen around the entire globe. So if you have some cousins or aunties in Uzbekistan, they'll be able to see it. But moreover, I just wanted to highlight the statistical anomaly of the event. However, I encourage you to check out my total solar eclipse video because there we demonstrate that the celestial signs that happen above our head are not random, therefore they have a purpose. And we demonstrate that biblically. For sake of time, I left that out, but definitely check that out. But first, can I get some different music? Perfect. Okay, now where were we? That's right. And now let's move on to the purpose of this conjunction and what it means. Since we now know that this conjunction couldn't just have happened randomly, given the statistical odds. So to do that, let's first see how the Bible defines a planet. And if you turn with me to Jude chapter one, we see wandering stars in verse 13. Now, when we examine the Greek word closer for wandering, it's actually planetai, which is where we get the English word planet. So we know that the Bible refers to planets as wandering stars. And according to Psalm 147, he counts a number of the stars and gives names to all of them. In fact, another place that states this is found in Isaiah chapter 40. Raise your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who brings out their multitude by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. And if you're familiar with names in the Bible, we know that they have meanings. Therefore, Jupiter and Saturn also have meanings as well. Now, Jupiter is the king planet. And we know that actually from the book of Acts. Remember when Paul and Barnabas are preaching? Well, the locals call Barnabas Zeus and Paul Mercury. And Zeus, the Latin equivalent, is Jupiter. And on a side note, it's interesting that we can pull some insights from some of these details within the Word of God, meaning that we can gain some insights through names and associations of the people mentioned in the Bible, in particular behind pagan myths and stories, because there are some truths rooted in the myths, which are basically biblical accounts of stories with some clear changes. In fact, let me give you an example, and I know this is a little off topic, but how it's really interesting, because through the connection, when Paul is riding on a merchant ship, a Greek merchant ship, the figurines mentioned are Castor and Pollux, 
which is the constellation of Gemini. And the Greek gods were associated with protecting sailors and therefore giving credence to that specific detail mentioned in Acts. Now, I say all that to say this. Remember, it's a truth rooted in a myth, but through this, God actually revealed a really unique connection in that Stranger Things video. Because remember, it was the two characters who were dressed as sailors to which he tied to the constellation of Gemini, and then that unraveled the celestial connection throughout the entire video cover. Sorry, I know that was a little off track, but I just thought maybe it might be useful. In order to give credence in understanding how Jupiter and in our next example, Saturn, are reflected biblically and what we can draw from that. But nonetheless, my whole point is that Barnabas, they reference as Jupiter and Jupiter or Zeus was the king of the Greek pantheon and is one of the ways that we know that Jupiter is the king planet. However, from a biblical perspective, we know that that really means Jesus as the king of kings. Now, how about Saturn? Well, Saturn is actually found in the book of Amos, where it states that the Jews in the northern kingdom had fallen away and began worshiping the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets, but in particular, King Sukkoth and Kayum. And I apologize if I butchered that, but it states that they made idols to their star god. And Sukkoth and Kayun or Kayun translates to Saturn, which was the Canaanite version of Moloch, or for all intents and purposes, Satan. And one other unique insight, not found in the Bible, but is a concept of the spiritual themes being held and symbolized in movies is the movie, The Lord of the Rings. Because who was the Lord of the Ring? Sauron, and Sauron is depicted with the eye, which is very much associated with occult and pagan practices. And anyways, it's the fact that that character is called the Lord of the Rings and Saturn well, has rings. What's also interesting about the planet Saturn is that it has a hex shaped storm on its North Pole and hexagrams are very much also associated with occult practices. So moreover, we know that Jupiter and Saturn in this particular conjunction is referencing the King of Kings versus Satan. In fact, just seven days prior was the total solar eclipse that was in Ophiuchus, which is the serpent wrestler. So we have two celestial events pointing to the same concept separated by seven days on the 14th and the 21st, which is also related to seven as well. So definitely very interesting. However, for the big moment on what this celestial sign is representing, well, it represents from a 5,000 foot view, the great reset, which I will dive into that in just one second. However, I wanted to make a side note comment in that this topic will be a series because I haven't even gotten into the constellations that this conjunction is in, some other outside sources that are stating the same thing about this referring to a great reset. So there's definitely a lot more to unpack with this, but for time's sake, just trying to give you a 5,000 foot view, a very general overview of what this sign in the heavens is representing, which is the great reset. So now let's talk about the Great Reset that this conjunction is pointing to because it's important that we define this accurately. And I apologize. In my previous video um, on UFOs, I stated that the unveiling of the UFOs was this Great Reset. In actuality, that should be classified as a false reset. So it's not entirely inaccurate, but it's not as accurate as it should be. Um, this is something I've been praying about and God revealed it to me in a very unique way, um, actually in the book of Daniel with King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and when God interprets it for Daniel to give interpretation to, to the king. So if you're familiar with the dream, remember that the materials that made up each individual part of the statue represented all the Gentile empires starting with Babylon all the way to the end times with the 10 toes. And we know that the 10 toes represents the final one world government. Well, mixed up 
in that one world government will be these UFOs and the Nephilim and the Mark of the Beast and all the different details. However, he explained it to me like this. Has anything changed, of course, other than the materials, about the statue? No, if anything, sin is just increasing. In fact, increasing exponentially by the time you're in the toes, but still very much the same statue. The reset is the rock that's not cut by human hands that destroys the statue and sets up a kingdom that lasts forever and ever. And we know that Jesus is the rock, and so this is symbolic of the kingdom that Jesus sets up. And that, that, brothers and sisters, is the great reset. However, if you remember, I stated that this conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter has layers underneath that, one of which is that it's representing the coming Antichrist and that he's very, very close. Hence why there is a connection to the total solar eclipse that happened on the 14th, because it fell in the middle of Hanukkah, which has to do with the second temple, with Antiochus Epiphanes, as we discover in Daniel chapter eight, because it's a foreshadow of the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist stands in the temple, highlighting that these two events are not coincidental because it precludes the Great Reset, which if we compare with my End Time Covenant video series, we know that he is very close from that perspective as well. So not only do we have it there, but we also have it signified in the heavens as well, which tells us that the rapture, brothers and sisters, is very close. I don't know when, because we don't know the day or the hour, but that after the 21st, it could be any day. And so why is that important? Well, this should give us a call to action that we need to be sharing the gospel with anybody and everybody that we come in contact with. And so if you're doing that already, then God bless and amen. And if you need a confirmation that we are approaching that very moment of the soon rapture, this sign should be it. This, if you understand the statistical probability and how huge that is, I ask that you pray about it to the Holy Spirit. I guarantee it, he'll confirm it to you. And lastly, I want to end with this one final detail from the book, The Star of the Messiah Reconsidered by Roy A. Rosenberg. Because in this book, his research showed that Johannes Kepler believed that the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction was a sign that the Magi saw from the East. In fact, from a Jewish astrological perspective, the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction linked the appearance of the Messiah and other great events, such as the birth of Moses. And again, underscores how big of a sign this really is. I can't emphasize that enough, but hopefully this video helped. If you guys have any questions or want to dig into this stuff more for yourself, of course, with prayer from the Holy Spirit, I'll put some links down below in the description to some items that might help facilitate that. Uh, because again, we prophesy in part, I'm not a prophet by any means, but that we can actually receive revelation about the present and future events. And so the fact that we receive it in part means that you have a part as well. And we work better together when we bring our parts together, uh, we get a fuller picture. So hopefully this video helps you out as a part and to do the same, definitely help me out because I, I don't know everything, I just don't. I'm not perfect by any means nor would I ever claim that I have error. In fact, that's why we should always take all things before the Lord to verify if what anyone says is true because the Holy Spirit cannot tell a lie. Um, something else worth mentioning is the fact that I'm gonna be doing a video on the previous total solar eclipse that happened on the 14th. Also in the works is a basics on biblical numerology and the mathematics because I cover a lot of that here and I know from some of the reports I've been hearing, it's been a little confusing. And so I just wanna clear that up by putting out a kind of a math-based video. Also, one other topic that is very important that God has been wanting me to put together is one on the Holy Spirit and the ramifications of what that truly means to have the Holy Spirit inside of us, the awesomeness of what that means. And so that will be an extensive deep dive into a lot of verses so, and I definitely want to show you all those because it's extremely important 
that it's not just picking one verse here and running wild with it. No, no, no. There's multitudes of verses that help bring to light how the Holy Spirit operates on a day-to-day -day basis in the life of a believer. So definitely stay tuned for that video. And with that said, this is where we'll end this video on the conjunction. I love you guys. Always praying for you all. We are in the midst of the ending of the greatest story of salvation, the greatest love story between a creator and his creation. So God bless and may God's grace and peace be with you. Amen, brothers and sisters.